In this video, you will gain an understanding of coma aberration, develop an ability to envision where the rays are going, and you'll see a sample calculation so that you can then do your own calculations of coma. Coma is an off-axis aberration, which means that oblique incidence is needed in order to actually see the loss of focus of certain rays. It's a consequence of a variation of transverse magnification as the location on the entrance pupil varies, which is contrary to the abe san condition, which says that the transverse magnification is a constant across the pupil. Coma is often referred to as an abe san condition breaker. Rays will converge at a different point depending on where on the pupil they fall. So marginal rays will converge in one place and more central rays in a different place. And this red ray here is the chief ray, which of course doesn't converge with anything but itself, but it defines the point of paraxial pierce. If these marginal rays focus at a point that's closer to the optic axis, then the coma is positive. And if they focus farther from the optic axis than all the other rays, then it's negative coma. In order to describe positive coma, let's go with the simple system of a single thin lens. And there are two coordinates that need to be used. The coordinate on the entrance pupil, rho, and the coordinate on the image surface, y. Coma is readily observed in the ray fan plots, which are generated by inspecting where the rays pierce the image plane. And let's look at this plane that's labeled paraxial focus. That's the point where the marginal rays overlap. The more central rays will focus at a point that's closer to where the chief ray pierces the image. And the red ray is the chief ray. And a ray fan plot is the location of each ray's piercing on the image plane versus where it pierces the pupil. And the location where the chief ray pierces the image plane is always taken as the zero. So a graph of image location versus pupil location will have the chief ray at the origin. And then the other rays will be offset from the origin because they're measured relative to that point. Coma aberration shows up as a concavity to that ray fan plot. If it's positive coma, it's concave down. If it's negative coma, it's concave up. And if we move along the optic axis to another point, such as is depicted here in the axis on the left, and repeat this exercise, a ray fan plot still comes out concave down, except at the point where it peaks changes. If you get off the praxial focus, now you will have rays that pierce the image plane higher than the chief ray. When you introduce defocus, that is you move off praxial focus, you also move the point where the coma peaks off of the chief ray. The distance between where the marginal rays focus and where the chief ray pierces the image plane is referred to as the tangential coma, as opposed to the sagittal coma, which I need to still describe to you. Coma is a third order Seidel aberration, which means it comes from the fourth order expansion term of the wavefront aberrations. Functionally, it depends on the pupil radial coordinate rho, the image radial coordinate h, and the angle theta, which is effectively the angle between rho and h, as h rho cubed cosine of theta. These exponents, 1, 3, and 1, tell you that it's the third order aberration. When the exponent of h and the exponent of rho add up to 4, that's a third order Seidel aberration. Besides being positive, the coma can also be negative. In that case, marginal rays focus above the optic axis from where the more central rays focus. The image plane on the left in this case is the paraxial focus. The focus of the marginal rays is higher than the other rays. And if you shift out from that paraxial focus, they pierce at even higher points. And so a ray fan plot generated by inspecting these rays is concave up because the extreme marginal rays are at a higher point on the image plane. And if you shift along the optic axis to the point on the right, there will always be rays that are lower than where the chief ray pierces. And so the minimum point of that upward concave curve shifts as well. Coma has a different effect on the sagittal and the tangential rays. The tangential rays approach as shown here along a vertical axis as opposed to the sagittal rays which approach along a horizontal axis. And of course, both are present at any time as the whole pupil is peppered with ray pierces. Rho is the radial coordinate inside the pupil of magnitude rho, direction theta, and h is the coordinate in the image surface, or y, because an argument can be made that because of the azimuthal symmetry of the problem, the image can be oriented arbitrarily along the y-axis on the image surface. So theta ends up then being the angle 
between the pupil pierce vector and the image pierce vector. We'll take a look at the effect of field angle on coma. When the field angle is zero, there is no coma. And as the field angle grows, the coma becomes more acute. Let's arrange for a bundle of rays to pierce the entrance pupil, in this case just this lens, and we'll arrange for them to pierce it in this square pattern. And all of the rays that pierce the lens should focus to the same point on the image surface, forming a coherent image that is just a point. But because of the presence of aberration, they don't all arrive at the image surface at the same location. Let's map out what becomes of this square arrangement of penetrating rays when they arrive at the image surface. They won't be a single point as you would hope if it's well focused, they'll be a snowman. The chief ray, which was the ray that penetrated the dead center of the pupil, is now at the top of this arrangement of spots. And the marginal rays are at the very bottom of it. It's often described as a comet. The term coma, which is the tail of a comet, is used for this kind of aberration. The separation between where the marginal rays and chief rays arrive at the image is the tangential coma. And the width of this whole blur is the sagittal coma because that occurs in the sagittal direction. Now translate to another image plane and the pattern grows from where it was at the praxial focus, which in the absence of all other aberrations is still the highest quality image point. I wasn't in charge back then, so I couldn't call it snowman aberration, but that is what I would have called it. In terms of the Seidel polynomial expansion, coma is this expression that includes the image coordinate to the power of 1, the pupil coordinate cubed, and the cosine of the angle between them to the power of 1. It's actually this W sub 131 coefficient, which is the business we're about to go about doing. Optical design software is used to compute W sub 131 because that tells you how much coma you actually have. It's the important scaling property. In order to calculate coma, which is measured in dimensions of length, the second Seidel coefficient needs to be computed for each surface of the system. Previously, I showed just a lens as the system, but a lot of systems are compound lenses with several glass surfaces and physical stop coma can be calculated for each of them and they can be summed up together. For a given surface, the Seidel coefficient for coma is readily calculated from the first Seidel coefficient, S sub 1, which is the product of the marginal ray invariant squared, the height of the ray, and the difference in horizontal angle over index of refraction on either side of the surface. Multiplying those three quantities together with the minus sign gives you the first Seidel coefficient, which is the spherical aberration. The physical quantities y sub i and u sub i can be described in a figure. The marginal ray is instant horizontally and strikes the pupil surface. u sub i is its angle relative to the horizontal. Because it's the marginal ray, that's zero. And then it refracts, and u sub i prime is the angle of refraction relative to the horizontal. All angles are relative to the horizontal. The chief ray comes along at an angle u sub i bar. Bar always refers to chief ray. And it strikes the pupil at a height of y sub i bar, which because this is chief ray is zero. And you have a different index of refraction on either side of the surface, different value of n. The marginal ray invariant is what you call a refraction invariant. Marginal ray invariant and chief ray invariants are quantities which are the same before and after refraction. The ratio of the chief ray invariant to the marginal ray invariant is used in order to convert the spherical aberration quantity into a coma quantity. The expressions for chief and marginal ray invariant are very similar, the simple difference being that the chief ray invariant uses chief ray quantities and the marginal ray invariant uses marginal ray quantities. Otherwise, it's the angle relative to the horizontal plus the height times the curvature of the surface times the index of refraction. And that quantity before and after the surface is the same. Clearly, we can cancel the index of refraction for this ith surface and then use it by multiplying this ratio times the first Seidel coefficient for the ith surface and then add it up over all of the surfaces. 
and you have the second Seidel coefficient, which is coma. And the chromatic wavefront aberration is actually half of that. S sub 2, as well as W sub 131, are measured in length units. If Y is in units of millimeters, then W sub 131 will be in units of millimeters. You can see coma by holding a pair of reading glasses, which are converging lenses, and focusing an image of the sun. You can make a well-formed image of the sun, and then you can see the coma forming as you change the angle of the lens so that it is not perpendicular to the incoming light from the sun. These are the working equations for calculating coma. W sub 131 is the goal, and we get it by calculating the second Seidel coefficient, which we get by first calculating the first Seidel coefficient, which is spherical aberration. Take that calculation of S sub 1 at each surface and correct it for the ratio of invariance at each surface, and then add it up for all the surfaces to get the second Seidel coefficient. Divide that by 2, and you have the chromatic wavefront aberration in units of length. What's typically done then is it's divided by the wavelength of light to give you the chromatic wavefront aberration in units of wavelengths. I set up an Excel spreadsheet to do this with numbers, and if you're going to do it with numbers, you need to have given a biconvex lens, these radii of curvature, a thickness, 10 millimeters, and entrance pupil diameter of 10 millimeters, meaning the marginal ray is incident 5 millimeters above the optic axis. Infinite conjugates allows me to take that marginal ray's angle relative to the horizontal to be zero, and the material is given with an index of refraction. So in the Excel spreadsheet, I have these three columns, which accommodate a single lens, two surfaces. The first column is the object space. The second column is the front surface, and the third column is the back surface of the lens. The blue numbers are inputs that the user types. The black numbers are calculated with a formula. So type in the radii of curvature for the surfaces. The curvatures, one over those, are calculated. The thickness of the lens was 10 millimeter. T is the distance behind the surface from one surface to the next surface, or in the case of surface 2, T is the distance from surface 2 to the marginal focus. Index of refractions are put in, and the powers are calculated with the power equation, n minus 1 times curvature. The marginal rays and the chief rays need to be set up. The marginal ray is 5 millimeters above the optic axis. It comes in with an angle of 0 degrees, which is an artifact of the infinite conjugates. The chief ray comes in at an angle of 10 degrees, and 0.1745 is just 10 degrees converted to radians. The marginal ray is analyzed using the Praxer ray trace equations. The marginal ray comes in at an incident horizontal angle of 0, so when it strikes surface 1, it is still at a height of 5 millimeters. However, it refracts at that surface, and Praxer ray trace equation number 2 is used to calculate the new angle relative to the horizontal inside the glass. And similarly, the chief ray has to be analyzed using the Praxer ray trace equations as well, and the angle is calculated with Praxer ray trace equation number 2. The invariants are calculated using the expressions from the previous screen, where we have the chief ray invariant calculated from the chief ray angle and the chief ray height at each surface, and the marginal ray invariant is calculated from the angle and height of the marginal ray at each surface. So now it would be appropriate for you to go back to the previous video on spherical aberration and look at the calculation of S1 for this problem, because now we're going to take S1 the spherical aberration Seidel coefficient, and adjust it with that ratio of invariance at each surface, add them up for each surface to get the coma Seidel coefficient, S2. And you'll notice minus 00296 is the sum of these two numbers. To get the coma aberration, W sub 131, divide that by 2. And you have the answer in millimeters. Usually, that is then divided by the wavelength for a monochromatic problem. In this case, we'll use 587 nanometers to get minus 2.52 wavelengths. That is the coma for this lens. Let's benchmark that against ZMAX. The same lens is put into Optic Studio. Coma is calculated, and we get W sub 1 through 1 of minus 2.550 wavelengths. Compare that to minus 2.52 wavelengths. 
The ray fan plots are made at three different field angles, zero degrees, seven degrees, and 10 degrees. And the graph on the left is the tangential, the graph on the right is the sagittal. And you'll notice that zero degrees, there's no concave up or concave down. There's no coma aberration for normal incidence on the first surface. Then at a seven degree angle of incidence, that's where the rays come in at seven degrees off the horizontal, we see concave up, so it's negative coma. And sure enough, we had our minus sign in the answer. And at 10 degrees, you also have the curvature. And the sagittal rays don't have this concave up feature to it. With the rays coming in at an angle, the lens is tilted not in the sagittal direction, but in the tangential direction. Spot diagrams at the image plane also reveal the coma. For normal incidence, that is zero degree field, there's just the well-focused dot. What width this dot has is a consequence of spherical aberration. And then at seven degrees, you can see the coma. And at 10 degrees, it's even more pronounced. Now you have a lens with coma. What if you don't want that coma? How would you have gotten rid of it? Well, there are two things you can do. Before you make the lens, you can design the lens to have no coma. The coma actually depends on the geometrical shape factor of the lens, the sum of the radii of curvature divided by the difference of radii of curvature. And it turns out that when that ratio equals 0 0.8, there's actually no coma for a single lens. It also happens to be true that the spherical aberration is a minimum at that point. Let's test out this idea that coma is zero when x is 0 0.800, 0, which you can quickly rearrange to be r2 is minus 9 times r1, by going into the YNU spreadsheet and putting that in. Here I am in the YNU spreadsheet. I have put in 100 millimeters for r1 and minus 100 millimeters for r2. So it is an equiconvex lens and you can see the coma comes out to minus 0 0.002. We'll make this minus 900 instead of minus 100 and see if it gets smaller. Well, it gets quite a bit smaller. Instead of 2 times 10 minus 3, it becomes 2 times 10 minus 6, which by the way is still not zero. I played around with it a little bit and I found out that I could set it to minus 910.795. And it's pretty small, at about 10 minus 9. It comes out pretty close. When R2 is minus 9 R1, you minimize coma in a lens. This is a balancing act between the aberrations of the front surface and the back surface. As is commonly the case in lens design, aberrations from different surfaces of different types and even of different orders are used to cancel each other out. You've made your lens and now it's too late to change that. What else can you do? You can use a stop. So if you put an aperture stop in front of the lens, you can change the amount of coma that is present. For example, if you put the stop right up at the front of the lens, which ray is the chief ray is the ray we've been assuming, the one that passes through the middle of the uh, entrance pupil. But if you shift that stop back, you change which ray is the chief ray. With the stop in front of the lens, it's this red ray. When you move the stop back farther, this yellow ray becomes the chief ray. And if you move it again, this orange ray becomes the chief ray. If you move the stop back and forth, you will find the magic place where for that stop position, the, what is the marginal rays, converge at the same place as the chief ray. And you have no coma. So you can eliminate coma by shifting the stop back and forth if the stop is in front of the lens. You can do it provided there is spherical aberration. If there's no spherical aberration present, then you can't adjust coma with stop shifting. We'll talk about that in a future video. Okay, that's everything there is about coma right now. We'll move on to astigmatism next and then curvature of field after that.